look at this question. Now, this question is a, it's a bit of a combination between topic 12, which is all about atomic structure, and topic 13, which is periodic trends. Now, in topic 12 and atomic structure, they delve in much deeper into the use of electron configurations to analyze trends in the periodic table. And one of the trends you need to know about in the periodic table is the trend in ionization energy of the elements. So the definition for ionization energy, I've just written it here for you. This is the energy required to remove one mole of electrons from one mole of gaseous atoms, and therefore its units are kilojoules per mole. So that's why in this graph of first ionization energy, we have units of kilojoules per mole on the side here. Now, my graph is slightly different to the graph in this question, but it shows the fact that if you start at row number one on the periodic table, or period one, which includes hydrogen and helium, you get a general increase in ionization energy as you go across the periodic table. So there's a huge jump here in ionization energy, and that makes sense because if you write down, as I say up here, the tip for answering these questions is always write electron configurations when analyzing trends in ionization energy. So always write electron configurations. So let's practice it. And you probably want your periodic table in front of you when you're doing this. So hydrogen is energy level or period number one. And the first type of orbital we always fill is the smallest type of orbital, which is an S orbital. And hydrogen has just got one electron, and you can see that from its atomic number of one. So the electron configuration for a hydrogen atom is 1s1, and for helium is 1s2. So the 1s2 orbital is full, and you can represent that just with a small box where you have an electron with a spin up and an electron with a spin down. In hydrogen, you can represent that with just one electron inside the s orbital box. So the helium um, atom is far more stable because it has a full s orbital. And if you have a full orbital, you are more stable. So whether it's an s orbital or a p orbital or a d orbital, once the orbital is full, you are more stable. The um, atom is effectively satisfied for that orbital. And that's why the helium atom, for example, has a much higher ionization energy than the hydrogen atom, because it really wants to hold on to that stable arrangement. Now, as you go on to row number two here, we start the row with lithium. And the general trend here, again, as we can see, is that ionization energy increases from left to right across the periodic table. But you can see that there are some anomalies in that trend. Now, anomaly is just a fancy word for something which does not follow the trend something a bit weird or out of place. So we've been asked to look at period three or row three on the periodic table, which is from sodium over to argon. And the two anomalies that we can spot there, the general trend I should say again, though, is an increase in ionization energy from left to right. And we should also point out why that is. So the reason that the ionization energy in general gets higher from left to right across the periodic table, it's very easy to answer this one, but students always forget, is that, of course, the atomic number is increasing from left to right as you go across the periodic table. And what does atomic number mean? Well, you're adding more protons. And protons are positively charged particles that you're adding to the nucleus. And so if you add more positively charged particles, even though you're also adding more electrons, the electrons are being added to the same shell. So if this is just a positive nucleus right here and electrons are being added to the same shell, the point here is that even though you might add another electron for every proton that you add, the electrons are the same distance from the nucleus. And so the effective nuclear charge, Z effective or effective nuclear charge is increasing as you add more protons across the period. So the general trend of an increase in ionization energy is because you're adding more protons as you go across the period. However, in this question, they're asking you to explain why you have this anomaly here between magnesium and aluminium, and why you also have this anomaly here between phosphorus and sulfur. So this is where we need to write the specific electron configurations for those four elements in order to figure out why there is a dip from the normal trend. Okay, so I'm going to take a look at the magnesium aluminium um, comparison first of all. So magnesium versus aluminium. Now let's go through their electron configurations. So magnesium is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. 
and then we get into row three on the periodic table and it has two electrons in its s orbital so that is a full s orbital which we could represent with a box down here an electron with a spin up and a spin down so that is quite a happy atom um, in the sense that it has a full s orbital now if you compare that to aluminium it has an electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p1. So what we've done here is we have our 3s2 orbital, and that is slightly lower in energy than 3p orbital, which of course has three suborbitals itself, and it has one electron, which is what we're talking about here with 3p1. So this is 3p1 and this is the 3s2. So what we're saying here is that it is, according to the graph, it is easier to remove the electron from the aluminium with the 3p1 situation than from the magnesium with the 3s2. And this simply comes down to the fact that, as you can see here, the 3p orbital is slightly higher in energy, or to put it more simply, the 3p orbital is slightly further from the nucleus than the 3s2 orbital. So if I just draw it like this, if we imagine there's a nucleus right here. So this is the nucleus right here in aluminium. And then we have the nucleus, the same point here in magnesium. But what we have here is the 3s2 orbital is this same distance here from the magnesium to the 3s2 orbital, but it is a greater distance to the 3p1 orbital. And so from the 3p orbital to remove that one electron, is going to take less energy because this is all about effective nuclear charge. The effective nuclear charge is reduced in aluminium because you now moved into the 3p orbital, which is slightly further away from the nucleus than the 3s orbital. So that explains our anomaly over here as we go from magnesium to aluminium. Of course, as we continue on from aluminium to silicon, silicon is going to be adding electrons to the same orbital now. So silicon would simply be um, everything we had for aluminium before, but it's going to be 3s2, 3p2. But those electrons are still being added now to the 3p orbital, which experiences the same effective nuclear charge. Okay, now to explain the other anomaly, the anomaly between phosphorus and sulfur, well, this is a slightly different explanation here. When we take phosphorus versus sulfur, so let's get some new space for that. So with phosphorus, phosphorus versus sulfur, phosphorus is going to be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p3. And then for sulfur, sulfur is everything we had there for phosphorus. So we'll just write that down again. 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, but 3p4. So the situation we have here is we can clearly see that the sulfur situation must be less stable than the phosphorus situation because it's easier to ionize sulfur than it is phosphorus. And that's because if you look at the phosphorus 3p orbital, it has a half-filled p orbital. So a half-filled p orbital is always going to be more stable than a partially filled p orbital with four electrons in it because once you put that fourth electron in, you have electron-electron repulsion within that suborbital. And that's what they're talking about in answer B here, where they talk about electron-electron repulsion and the fact that if it's greater, then the, that um, orbital will be less stable and so it's easier to ionize. So that's why the answer to this question is B.